what's up youtube car boss here back in another video where we talk cars money investing and this is the third episode of the workshop series where we go in depth into some details of car investing which no one talks about and in this episode we tackle a hot topic for every car investor and that is grading all right let's go for the last three years or so there's been plenty of emphasis on car grading and from the usual big two of psa and bgs there was also the emergence of sgc alongside lesser known brands such as HGA, CGC and so on. While there are many options to choose from, most investors normally gravitate towards the big two and time and time again the topic of PSA versus BGS gets brought out, crunch and tackled countless of times on YouTube, social media, Reddit etc. While there are two very large school of thoughts about this, the general consensus of what most people are saying about these two brands are this. PSA generally has a better resale value but PSA is expensive due to using the expected value model and all the upcharges. BGS, on the other hand, has a nice solid slabs but atrocious turnaround time. So basically, there's no right or wrong answer to which grading company you go for, or which most of the time it's a decision depending if you are an investor, flipper, or collector. Simple, right? Well, in today's workshop video, I'm going to share my own personal grading strategy and how this strategy has done pretty well in the last three years or so. Caveat here is that the grading company doesn't dictate the value of the card, it all comes down to the actual card itself, its quality as well as market conditions at the time. Alright, so let's talk a bit about these two big grading companies, PSA and BGS. PSA is perhaps the leading grading and authenticator in the world at the moment due to the large number of slabs out there as well as the number of slabs it churns out on a daily basis. It's crazy to think how a company like PSA can create so much economic value by performing a service that just takes a couple of minutes or maybe a few seconds to encase your car with a piece of plastic. What is this economic value? Well, take something, say $100 cost, you pay a service fee of 20 bucks and it becomes $200. That $80 incremental gain is the economic value. Well, of course, um, Beckett and all the other grading companies out there does the same thing, but what makes PSA so special? Well, it's the sheer volume and the general acceptance by the market that PSA is the go-to place to generate wealth and value. Becker, on the other hand, is coming in the second place, pretty close, and not because they do a worse job at grading or authentication. The subject of quality has always been a big debate for a while now, but it's mainly due to, again, the perception of the market to get the better value. And that's basically the long version of what people are saying. Go PSA if you plan to sell. But of course, it runs much deeper than that due to the sheer volume of PSA slabs that's already in the market and entering the market on a daily basis. Price data on these slabs increases over time. While statistically, it becomes less rare, but it actually gives a more accurate indication of prices and its movement. Now, price movements of a card, which is say, POP100, and transacted 20 times a month provides a more reliable data compared to a card that is say POP2 and likely transacted once every two months, for example. It can be easier to make a general statement to say that there are just more PSA slabs out there compared to any other grading company for sports cards. And most of the time, people attribute the higher pop count to a decrease in value. For the unnumbered high print cards, base cards, and in some cases, you know, ultra modern silver editions, that assumption is probably true. But to my earlier point of having a healthy pop count means more comps and more liquidity in transactions. And on the flip side, having an extremely low pop count or rare pop count, say a pop one or pop two, for the lesser in demand grading companies such as SGC or HGSA, you know, doesn't mean it's more valuable. So circling back to my own grading strategy, it's quite obvious PSA is the grading company of choice and most of you who follow my channel do know I love raw cards. They are priced between $50 to $500 range, which I would say represents the bulk of my portfolio quantity-wise, that is. For this range of cards, you know, PSA churns these out like butter made from milk, consistent and reliable. The current prices say value bulk submissions is $19 before insurance and shipping, which is kind of acceptable in my opinion. So when do I actually branch out from PSA? I guess the common submissions to Beckett would normally be autograph cards. Beckett highlights the quality of the auto in a separate tab and lets you know how clean the autograph is versus how PSA somehow just tries to squeeze in as much text as possible into that already tiny label. So. From the aesthetic point of view, Beckett is kind of many notches higher in terms of for their dual service cards. But 
I think that's where the advantages stop and that is just aesthetics alone. And while looking less pleasing, PSA Dual Service Labs for some reason commands a higher return of similar great results when compared to its backer counterpart. Hence, um, from a financial standpoint, PSA seems to be very ahead overall in my opinion. However, there are times when I do place a bit more emphasis on the aesthetics, especially on the bigger and iconic cards. But I have to admit, there are instances which I choose backward, and it's not for the reasons you imagine. So here's some pro tips which I use, but not necessarily a rule for everyone to follow. Tip number one, do not create off-center cards. Now, even if you believe the centering is 70-30 and you get a PSA 9, don't do it. Even if you think that you will get a backer subgrade of 8.5 and the other grades will lift it up to a mid-9, don't do it. The fundamental of IOP is so important to a buyer and even if a card is a PSA 9 or a BGS mid-9, the fact that it looks off-center, it kind of throws away the IOP and just reduces your chance of selling the card. But if you really insist of getting an off-center card graded on go BGS, PSA will punish you dearly. Tip number two, do not grade ding cornered cards. Now, similar to above, ding corners can get you a grade of anywhere between three to six, pretty obvious, right? But then again, why do still people grade cards with ding corners? You have to consider the card and its purpose. For me, it's set flipping. And I've done a video on set collecting and we'll do another one in the future, but the short summary is when it comes to set building for flipping, the core value of the set lies in the anchor cards, which means the main cards like the players or the characters you know lesser emphasis is placed on grades of the lower tier cards so take for example the 1986 field basketball set the valuation of the complete set is mainly determined by what grades the michael jordan is the hakeem olajuwon or magic johnson and less so when you say you have a high grade charles oakley for example but because you want them all slapped in a uniform set you know these filler cards can actually come in lower grades which Having one with a ding corner is not entirely a bad thing from an overall cost-based perspective. And lastly, tip number three, do you avoid cards with print lines? Again, it depends. Print lines are an eye source, so let's get that out of the way and therefore it affects the eye appeal and in most cases bring down the overall final grade as well. So generally speaking, we all want to avoid sending cards with print lines for grading. The caveat will be production defects on all or a big part of the entire production run whereby having print lines is generally a norm and from my experience you know, BGS has been kind of lenient on those type of print lines. So if a card looks great all around with just a manufacturing print line you might be surprised with the end result that you get from BGS. So to wrap things up there's no clear answer on the one best grading company or the one company that would give you the best results right. So there are different factors to consider before choosing kind of card you want to send to whom you want to send to and also do remember not every raw card that you pull or own is meant for grading from a strategic point of view uh, do check out my previous episode where i talked about encase cards as a viable strategy all right that's all i got for this episode of the cardboard workshop join me again for future episodes by like and subscribing to my channel and i'll see you guys again soon cardboards out